Welcome to Hartman Math. This is lesson 10.6, parametric equations. So let's take a look. Let's see if we had a regular equation. Y equals negative x squared over 72 plus x. We call that a rectangular equation if it's in terms of x and y. And we could plot it on a rectangular coordinate plane. Uh, we can break that up into parametric equations where we define the x coordinate and the y-coordinate in terms of some other variable called the parameter. Oftentimes that might be T standing for time. So if we're talking about a projectile following a path, launched, kicked, hit with a golf club, something like that, where the projectile is following this motion, we're looking at it in terms of X and Y, but it may be easier to think of this in terms of where is it in terms of as a position of time. Where is it after one second, two seconds, and so on. So that's what parametric equations are when we define our uh, variables x and y in terms of another variable. So to define that, we say that f and g are continuous functions of a function t, where t is the parameter, on an interval i. Continuous just meaning uh, you, if you were drawing that function you could trace it without lifting your pencil. There's no breaks, there's no holes, there's no vertical asymptotes. Uh, think of piecewise function, it doesn't jump from one place to the other. Uh, then set of uh, ordered pairs x is defined to be uh, f of t, y defined to be a different function g of t. Uh, t is the parameter and i is the interval. For example, number one, sketching this curve uh, given in terms of parametric equations, we define x and we define y. They're both defined in terms of t. t is our parameter, and then here is the interval for t, the restrictions on t. t is go, going to go between negative 2 and positive 2. There's our interval. So we can kind of do a table of values, but we have t, our parameter and then our variables x and y. So when t is negative 2, substitute that in, we get x is 1, and over here 2 times negative 2 is negative 4, so we've got a point on our graph at 1 comma negative 4. And we take a look at what happens next as we move from negative 2 to positive 2, taking a look at negative 1, negative 1 squared times a half minus 1 is negative a half, 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. Right there. So if we finish this up, again, keep substituting in 0, and we get a point, and 1, and we get a point, and 2, and we get a point. So we've got our curve that we started here, it goes to here. Not only do we want to graph the curve, but we also want to show which direction or what the path is happening. So we kind of show that with these arrows to say we're traveling this way and not this way according to our interval. So we went this way, that's the motion of the projectile. All right, so another example one, let's do the same thing, but let's do it on a graphing calculator. We're going to do so in parametric mode. So go ahead and grab your graphing calculator and I'll grab mine. We're going to begin by pressing mode. That's going to get us into where we can change it into parametric mode. If we arrow down to FUNC for function and arrow to the right, PAR is going to indicate parametric. So we select that. Now we're going to input our x and our y. When we normally input function, we do so within the y equals, so we'll press y equals. And now it looks a little bit different than normal because we're in parametric mode. It says x1 as a function of t equals. So we'll go and press our standard variable button, x, t, theta, n. And because we're in parametric mode, it's going to input that as t. We want that squared, so hit the x squared button, plus 1, arrow down, 
to the y1 as a function of t is 2t divided by 3. And we do have an interval, so we're going to go look at our window. Press window. So t min is, we wanted to go between negative 1 and positive 4. So negative 1 will be the t min t max 4. t step just means how often it's going to do its calculations. So whatever's in there should be good. The rest of it is our standard window. For now, let's assume that that's going to be okay. We'll see if we need to adjust. Press graph. So as you can see, we've got a lot of wasted space on the left, and we're not sure how far we've gone to the right. We'd like to see a little bit more of that. So we're going to adjust our window. Window. So we definitely don't need all these negative values. So maybe we change that to negative 2. We definitely need to see more of this. Let's go to 20. We could change it so that the marks are every two units. And again, we probably don't need this either. So negative 5 to 5 because it stayed pretty much in the center graph. And now we see a true picture as it went and ended out here. In fact, if we wanted to explore that, we could calculate, second trace, a value that says what t value do we want. Right, right at the end our t value was 4 and we're right here when x is 17 and y is 2.6666666 probably meaning eight-thirds. Eliminating the parameter. We're going to try to do this if we want to go from parametric equations and turn it back into regular rectangular form, back into just x's and or y's. So we're going to take these and choose one of the two equations and solve for t, whatever seems easier. Now this one I'd be a little bit afraid of, because we'd have square root and we wouldn't be sure if we're talking about plus or minus. So definitely the second one here, solve that one for t, replace that in the original equation and the other one, since we got it from this one, we're going to put it back into the other one. And then just to simplify. So we've got it now in a rectangular form. There are also different forms of that. We might say, I want this as a conic section in general form, so maybe you also said x minus 4y squared plus 4 equals 0, something like that. There are different forms here. So let's take a look at that. Example number 2, let's sketch the curve represented by the equations by eliminating the parameter and adjusting the domain of the resulting rectangular equation. So we're going to solve one of these for uh, t. I want to do this one. So I'll solve this equation for t. So we could start by, if we wanted to flip this up, we could take the reciprocal on both sides. So 1 over x is the square root of t, and then square both sides. There's our step 1. We're going to solve for t. If we do so, there we have t is 1 over x squared. Now substitute that into the other equation, so replace that t with 1 over x squared. So 2 times 1 over x squared squared minus 1. We get y equals 2 over x to the fourth minus 1. So we've got our equation. Let's address the domain situation. So back here, what we know about t is it has to be greater than or equal to 0, being that it's in the square root. But also, it can't be 0, because the square root of 0 is 0, and then 1 divided by 0 is undefined. So it's got to be greater than or equal to 0, but it can't be 0. So it has to be strictly greater than 0. So if we substitute in a value greater than 0 here, we're going to get some sort of a positive number when we take the square root. When we divide 1 by any positive number, we're going to get a positive number. So it turns out that x 
would also have to be greater than zero. So if we go to graph this, which is gonna be something like, if we think of two over x uh, to the fourth, it's being somewhat of a parent function, a variation of one over x squared, which looks like this, stretched by a, vertically by a factor of two and shifted down one. But if x is greater than zero, we don't want the left-hand part. We're just gonna want the part on the right. So in terms of the graph, we've got Negative one is a horizontal asymptote, back from chapter two. We've got x equals zero is a vertical asymptote. We've got these points here that have been stretched up to positive two because of the two. And that would be the graph of this. But again, we're saying x has to be greater than zero so it's only this part. And if we think of what the path would look like, so we should actually put some arrows on this. If we substitute in something like 0.1, we get a very large value up here. If we substitute in 1, we're going to get this value. If we substitute in 2, we get this value. So we can see uh, from the t's as we go up in our interval, we're going to be traveling along this way. Example number three, we now see x and y being defined in terms of theta instead of t. So theta is our parameter, it's an angle, and our interval has theta being between 0 and 2 pi. So kind of the way we want to go here is it would be difficult to actually solve for uh, theta in this case, and we're dealing with inverse trig functions, whereas it might be easier for us to think of a way to relate these two functions, cosine theta and sine theta. So instead of actually solving for theta, we're going to solve for either uh, sine theta or cosine theta, and this is actually both of them. So what does cosine theta equal? What is sine theta equal? That's step one. Solve for cosine theta, solve for sine theta. This one's already done, this one pretty easy. We'll just divide both sides by two. Now, is there a way to relate these two functions? How are sine and cosine related? Besides tangent, what it brings in another function, is there another identity back from trigonometry? Like sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. Now we can replace cosine theta with x, but remember it's supposed to be cosine theta squared. So x squared, sine squared theta, here's our sine theta, so we got to square that. And there's our equation. What is this a rectangular equation of? We know back from earlier in chapter 10, that's an ellipse. It's a vertical ellipse with the vertices up and down 2, co-vertices left and right 1, all we now need to get is the direction that it is spinning. So if we think of theta being 0, cosine of 0 is 1. 2 times sine of 0 is 0. So we would start here. Think, all right, now I start moving. What's the next theta? Maybe I try something like pi over 2. Uh, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Sine of pi over 2 is 1 times 2 is 2. So we went from here to here. So we're going in that direction. So path will look like that. Example number four, given a rectangular equation, can we develop parametric equations to go with it? Well, there's actually multiple ways of doing it, so it's probably going to ask you to do it in multiple ways. First way is pretty basic. The easiest way to approach this is just to define x has t, so x equals t. If we do that, then y, as we replace the x with t, y would just be 1 over 1 plus t squared, and there is a set of parametrics. Remember, for parametrics, we're going to need an x equals equation and a y equals equation. Right, let's try something else, kind of looking here, but 
would be a good way to define x. Kind of thinking maybe we go the square root of t, because we're going to have to, whatever we choose, we're going to have to square it. So what if we said x was the square root of t? Then y is equal to 1 over 1 plus, take our square root of t and square it, that would be 1. We need another one. We can maybe say, clearly we say x equals t squared, and then that's t to the fourth, not too difficult. What if we said t plus 1? Then y is going to be 1 over 1 plus, take that and square it. There you have it. And that's it for today. I'll see you next time.